So welcome back, everyone, after this um, fantastic second keynote. Um, welcome to our session on sensory systems. Um, as you've all probably figured out by now, you can use the chat window to talk about the talk. But if you want to ask questions, please push the ask a question button and ask a question there. Um, so Anton, if you can put your um, slides on now. OK, lots of echoes, sorry, I'll put in. Is it better now? Okay, does it does it work now? Can you still hear me without echo? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so our first speaker will be Anton Archipov from the Allen Brain Institute. And he'll talk about towards multipurpose biolistic models of cortical circuits. Anton, your serious. Okay, thank you. Um, so, can everyone hear me? Let me just double check. All right. Okay, I'll go ahead. So yeah, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for um, for letting me speak today and for putting together this really nice conference. Um, and uh, I'm coming from the Allen Institute for Brain Science uh, in Seattle, uh, which is um, sort of famous for uh, providing large. Uh, complex and uh, high quality data sets um, on um, different different aspects of uh, brain composition, uh, connectivity and function. And today I'll be telling you about how we use this data to build models, uh, biologically realistic models of cortical circuits, uh, currently with the focus on the mouse visual cortex. So, um, these are the models that we constructed. Uh, they've been published recently, so most recently in this paper in Neuron. And they, uh, as I said, focus on uh, mouse V1, primary visual cortex of the mouse, so here at the back of the brain. Um, and um, this is the illustration. So they span, this, these models, they span um, all six layers of the cortex from layer one down to layer six. Uh, they contain 230,000 cells approximately, <clears throat> incorporate a lot of the realistic biological data, um, include multiple cell types, uh, cell classes, so 17 cell classes uh, in this particular case. And uh, we built two versions of these models. So one is a biophysically detailed um, model where um, the central central portion of the model is represented using biophysically detailed compartmental morphologically realistic neuronal models. And the other on the right here is a point neuron version where uh, each neuron uh, on the left, uh, by the biophysically detailed model of a neuron, <clears throat> is instead now represented um, by a point neuron, generalized link integrated fire models. And so there is a one-to-one -one mapping between this biophysical and point neuron models in the sense that every single neuron, uh, its coordinates, the connectivity to all the other neurons are exactly the same between these two models. And so basically they are copies of each other with the only difference being that uh, the level of resolution that's being used to represent neurons in, in one and the other case. And um, so if there is uh, only one thing that you can take from my talk today, uh, I would um, urge you to uh, remember this, that these models are freely available. We've built them, we optimized them, we did some science with them and published them in papers, but the main thing is that we made them publicly available to everyone here on this website. You can download them together with all the metadata that uh, went into building these models, uh, simulation results, 
and um, you can use them for your own purposes. Um, of course, the biophysically detailed model is, is quite computationally expensive, so you need you know hundreds of CPUs to run it efficiently. Uh, you can get maybe uh, one simulated second uh, in one hour of computational time. But the point neuron model is certainly suitable for almost any lab. Uh, so it, uh, it runs on a single CPU. You get about one simulated second in three minutes. Um, and so, yeah, we really welcome uh, people using these models. You know, if you are working on the visual system, visual cortex, uh, great. If you don't, maybe you can consider this as a sort of a zero order approximation of a cortical canonical circuit and use it for whatever purposes, make perturbations, test your theories, uh, make predictions. Um, so it's all there for everyone. OK, um, so how did we achieve this? Um, we've built some tools. Um, and um, I, I'll just mention here that we, um, uh, we present these tools in a workshop, uh, in a workshop on Tuesday, uh, the workshop on tools and resources for developing and sharing models in computational neuroscience. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, very interesting talks there about different tools, including ours. And so the tools um, are the Brain Modeling Toolkit, which is a software we built for running simulations. It doesn't run simulation itself. It's actually an interface to establish tools like Neuron and Nest, but it allows one to inter in interact with these tools quite efficiently and conveniently. And then uh, another thing we created is this modeling file format we call Sonata. Uh, we did develop it together with the Blue Brain and, and other colleagues. And so this is a format to represent models efficiently. And that's how we share our models uh, with the community. So both tools are there. And, and uh, come listen at the workshop if you want to hear more. OK. And so. Um, also, how we build models, um, I'll, I'll discuss in detail uh, in another workshop, workshop W6 here on open data tools and models from the Allen Institute on Wednesday. And uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be a really cool workshop where I will talk about all kinds of different aspects of the Allen Institute data, as well as uh, how this data are being put together into models. But briefly, basically what's happening is that uh, at the Allen Institute, we have uh, different types of data. For example, data that characterize morphologies and electrophysiological properties of individual cells. And so we combine those for, for different cell types into models of single neurons and then put them together into this uh, model of the whole circuit of, of the whole cortical area. Uh, there is data on the connectivity, uh, microconnectivity, connectivity between individual neurons and different uh, neuronal types. And um, actually, for this work, we mostly use data from the literature. But in the recent couple of years, uh, a lot of really cool new data came out at the Allen Institute. And they're really ripe for developing the uh, next version of the model. And then finally, neurophysiology in vivo. And so primarily, we've been using uh, neuropixels recordings, so um, large scale electrophysiological recordings in the mouse uh, visual cortex and uh, thalamus in vivo. And so these data are used to um, first optimize models um, to make sure that um, that uh, what, what they do is uh, realistic and in the sense of you know the firing rates, the distributions of firing rates. Um, but then uh, certainly they are also used to test the models when these models are constructed and optimized. Uh, we test them on the held out data to see how well we perform uh, in comparison with the experiment. And one thing I'll mention quickly here is that the optimization, usually uh, we, we do the optimization on a very small subset of the data, um, very, very, very specific stimulus, so a particular instance of a drift and grating. But then we test the performance on the model on a variety of different stimuli and different metrics. And so um, let's talk about that a little bit here. Um, so one other aspect of this model is that we've built a relatively realistic representation of visual inputs for this model. So uh, that's done using over 17,000 uh, models of cell, uh, of, of uh, thalamic cells of 14 different types, all of which were uh, tuned to, uh, to reproduce experimental measurements in vivo. And uh, those cells are represented as filters that operate in the visual space. 
And so because of that, one can use uh, arbitrary visual stimuli, drifting grating, static gratings, noise, uh, natural scenes, natural movies, anything. Anything that, uh, let's say, your experimental uh, collaborator is using to provide visual stimuli for their experiments, you can use, uh, take it, run through our model, any movie, and of course it will take some computation, but uh, after that you will have uh, spike trains that can be used to supply inputs uh, to our model. And uh, the way how those spike trains converge on individual neurons in V1 is really, uh, we, we spent a lot of time to constrain that uh, using a lot of experimental data from the literature. Uh, the, the, the bottom line here is that arbitrary visual stimuli can be processed. And as a result, we, we uh, try to run our model with a number of different visual stimuli and then compare with the experiment. Um, so this is one example. Here on the right, uh, we ran simulations uh, where, uh, you know, we uh, turn on a grating stimulus uh, at uh, 500 milliseconds and then run the simulation for 3000 milliseconds. Uh, showing the activity here of 50,000 neurons in the center. So a lot of um, you know, different patterns of activity for different neuronal types. And then we can take activity of these types and uh, compute uh, distributions uh, of different characteristics. So in our paper, you can see that we computed a lot of different metrics for different stimuli. And one example here is the direction selectivity index. So how directionally selective neurons are, we can compare for different cell types. Uh, of the experiment, so in gray here, and then uh, two version, the biophysical and the point neuron version of the models. And you see that for this metric, uh, the model does relatively well. Uh, for some other metrics, uh, you know, some metrics do well, some, some do less well, but overall uh, we found the performance to be pretty good. So this is testing the model, and, and then you know you can ask uh, for, for, the, for the metrics that uh, show uh, less good performance, Maybe we maybe these are the directions in which the improvement should be made in the future generations of this model. But then we also, uh, in doing this exercise, we've uh, came up with some predictions. And this is again just one example. You can read uh, more in the paper. But um, one thing that we found has to do with this like to like uh, connection strength. And so um, that, that, that basically works this way. If you have two neurons that uh, prefer similar stimulus, let's say the same orientation or similar orientation of, uh, of a moving stimuli on the visual field, uh, the connectivity between them, the, the strength of the connection is stronger than uh, when the neurons prefer different stimuli, especially orthogonal ones. So that's what we refer to as a like-to-like -like connection strength. And we found that that was really important to uh, capture uh, experimental uh, observations with our model, in particular direction selectivity. And it was especially important for certain cell types. For example, for interneurons of SST and VIP types, turns out they do not receive much of the external inputs from the thalamus. And so the recurrent connections with this like-to-like -like properties turned out to be really important for them. And so here we do a simulation where uh, in orange is our original model, and you see that uh, different uh, layers in the SST interneurons have uh, relatively high direction selectivity. But then when we change the connectivity rule and now the connection strength is uniform, uh, then the, uh, the direction selectivity of those neurons uh, becomes very small. Okay. So um, finally, uh, now that this model is ready, we offer it to the community, but we also continue doing work uh, on several projects with this model trying different applications. And one application that I want to highlight uh, is perturbations. So of course, this is something very, uh, very uh, sort of hot area uh, in experiments. And with the models, you have a lot of control here. Uh, and you can you can explore a lot of different parameters. So just an example, you know, this is an intact model uh, running a simulation for three seconds. But then if we silence excited air cells in layer four, then you get this. Of course, layer four is completely silent, but then other neurons are strongly affected as well. And we can do that for any, any cell of any type um, the, the way we want in the model. So uh, in this project, we are working together uh, with internal collaborators, Stefan Michalas and um, Bin Huan Tsai, and also with external collaborators, so with Chris Harvey at Harvard. Uh, so Chris published this paper last year where he showed that um, 
uh, perturbing a single layer to three neuron produces this uh, sort of center surround effect where uh, other neurons uh, are excited. So if we excite a layer to three neuron, right, the other neurons that are close to it are also excited, but neurons further away are inhibited. And we observed the same thing. So that's good. That's the confirmation that our model works well in this respect. Look at uh, further. And so this is an example of uh, trying to make a prediction now with the model, which is reported in this biograph paper, where we basically show that the system can switch between the efficient and robust coding. So here we excite uh, a certain number of neurons that are similarly tuned from 1 to 100. And then uh, in this orange and blue lines, look at what happens with uh, similarly tuned neurons. And it turns out that for high contrasts, for, for, for strong stimulus, uh, these, um, these similarly tuned neurons, their uh, activity is suppressed. So that's, uh, that's efficient coding, right? If you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of neurons that talk about the same thing, uh, a few of them start talking and then the rest can, can shut down and save their uh, effort. Uh, so like efficient coding. But then if, if the contrast is 5%, so there's a small uh, weak stimulus, turns out the trend is different. And now instead of uh, instead the activity of the similarly tuned neurons goes up uh, with excitation of more and more neurons. And so now this is more like a robust coding where you have uh, all neurons talking and supporting each other. And so what we show here is this model where it looks like we can switch between these two different regimes. Of course, needs to be tested experimentally, but you know one example of what types of studies this model can be used for. And there are many more. I just don't have time uh, to talk about all of them. But um, again, so I'll finish here. Uh, basically, uh, we have these models. They are open for the community. Please use them and give us feedback. And then finally, um, I invite everyone to uh, join this workshop that we will uh, do in a month from now, uh, where we will talk a lot about models, the Allen Institute models, uh, other models, um, a lot of exciting speakers, uh, experimentalists, and modelers. And uh, so uh, please join us there. OK, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, OK, so there's one question here. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just read the question. So um, to what extent could be your V1 connectivity used as a proxy for a canonical neocortical circuit or column? And how much is it different from other neocortical areas? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, so I think um, to, to what extent depends really on your purposes and applications and uh, also how is it different from other cortical areas i mean to, to a large extent we don't know uh, v1 is one of the best studied uh, cortical areas in terms of um, understanding its connectivity we know that uh, some other cortical areas uh, have uh, you know substantial differences in composition or connectivity for example, uh, V1 is at the back of the brain. If you go to the front of the brain, you will have, uh, for example, fewer PV inhibitor neurons. Uh, in some cortical areas, you essentially don't have layer four, uh, which is very important, um, you know, input layer in primary sensory areas. So, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, we, we don't really know for a lot of the areas. We just don't know at, at the micro level how the connectivity is organized. And frankly speaking, we don't really know that for V1 as well. There are a lot of you know data here and there. In building our model, we, we had to use some data that were not from V1. We had to use some data that were not from the mouse even. Um, but I think especially for sensory area, that's a good first order approximation. That there are some similarities and you probably can uh, more. Okay, thank you. And maybe a second question. Um, so, how much do you lose in the point neuron model version with respect to the biophysically detailed version? And which type of experiments are you not able to reproduce with the simplified version of them? Yeah, excellent. Uh, well, so I personally think that uh, the point neuron version is, is good to use for a lot of applications. We are using, right now, once we build this model and compare them extensively, I would say we probably use uh, point neural models, 
I don't know, like 70% of the cases. Uh, but it certainly depends on the applications. We found that for the firing rate uh, characteristics that we tested, uh, the two models perform very similarly. But there are some questions that you simply cannot address with point neuron models, or at least that's very difficult. So one uh, example, a project that we have that we are working on together with Gauta Einewo uh, in Norway is compute and local field potential. And in principle, you could do it with point neuron models, but the uh, biophysically detailed models are more amenable to that. So yeah, it, it should be really a, a driven by a question you want to ask. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so Anton, I'll thank kick you, you out. <laughs> thank you again. And I'll invite the next speaker on. Yes, and for more questions, there will be uh, uh, on Eurostars, you'll find uh, a dedicated page for you to talk, and then you can ask your questions there, and Anton, you can answer them. Thank you. Hello. Okay, hello. Hi. Um, so can you try to share your screen? Sure. Okay, okay great. Okay. So our next speaker is Ali Almazi from the National Vision Research Institute in Melbourne, and he'll talk about how single statistics affect the separate field of D1 cells. Um, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I want to talk to you about how similar statistics change the receptiveness of cells in primary visual cortex. So a great deal of what we know about the sensory coding in the visual system is based on a stimulus response characterization of neurons. For example, to study the kind of processing that happens in the primary visual cortex, we often present a bunch of visual stimuli to an animal, and we record the neural responses to those visual stimuli, and uh, we treat the whole system as black box, and we use some system identification techniques to see how the output of the system, which is the neural responses, depend on the input to the system, which is the uh, visual stimulus. So um, this characterization of a neuron based on a stimulus response gives a description for uh, this neuron, which is known as uh, its receptive field. Um, the question that we asked was that how much this characterization depends on the type of stimulus that is presented to the neuron. Um, or to be more specific, if we present two completely different set of stimuli like white noise and natural scenes to the neurons in primary visual cortex, um, what would be the difference in the way that uh, these neurons respond to these two stimulus types? Um, so to characterize the receptive of a neuron, a model is often used, and uh, this is the model that we have used in our study. So in this model, these filters account for the uh, receptive filters of the cell and um, these bands of red and blue indicate the on and off subregions of, uh, of the filter, which are sensitive to increments and decrements in light intensity. And the output of each filter indicates the similarity between the visual input and the special structure of, uh, of the filter. It basically tells us how much of this special structure or feature is embedded in the visual input in terms of the contrast of this feature. And uh, because of this, we Call the output of each filter its feature contrast. And in the next stage of the model, um, there are some nonlinear functions called input functions that are applied on the output of these special filters. And there are some up to form a generator signal for the neuron. And there is a sparking nonlinearity in the, um, in the form of a parametric group exponential function that converts this generator signal into the firing rate for the neuron. So uh, this model has a great advantage that it does not assume any 
a particular shape, shape or form for these special filters or these nonlinear functions, and they are estimated non-parametrically from the neural data, uh, which makes this model also biologically motivated. So again, uh, the aim of our study was to see how characterization of V1 cells using uh, this model change as the visual input changes between natural scenes and white gas and noise. Um, so we did a series of experiments in which we uh, recorded from the cat primary visual cortex using multi linear probes, uh, while at the same time we were presenting uh, interleaved blocks of white gas and noise and natural scenes uh, to the animal. So these are examples of the uh, stimuli that we've used in our experiments. Uh, so on the left there is an example of a natural scene and on the right there is an example of white gas and noise. These two stimulus types um, were matched in mean luminance and global RMS contrast, but uh, the main difference between these two stimuli was uh, in terms of the second and higher order statistical dependencies, which are very strong in natural scenes, but uh, they don't exist in white noise. And to characterize or uncover the receptive of a neuron, we basically estimated the parameters of the model um, that I showed you before using a maximum likelihood estimation method, uh, which was done on the set of all uh, model parameters simultaneously using a joint optimization. Um, so this is an example of the way that a V1 cell responded to these stimulus types. Um, so what I'm showing here is the post-stimulus time histogram of the responses of this cell uh, to natural scenes in green and to white gas in noise in magenta. Um, so we can see there are pronounced differences in terms of uh, firing rate and uh, response latencies between these two response patterns. Uh, so this cell responds with a higher uh, firing rate and shorter latency to natural scenes than to white gas and noise. Um, we also looked at the whole population of the newborn cells, and uh, for each cell, we plotted the response latency to natural scenes against the response latency to white gas and noise. And we did the same thing for the firing rate of the neurons. Uh, for the response latency, we noticed that um, all cells responded with a shorter latency to natural scenes, which was on average about 11 milliseconds shorter than uh, white gas and noise. And most V1 cells um, responded with the highest spike to natural scenes that to white gas and noise images. Um, so now I'm going to show you an example of a receptive characterization of a V1 cell using natural scenes and white noise. So it's a cartoon image of um, our example cell. When we present a natural scene to uh, this, this cell, its response was best described using a receptive structure um, that had these three special filters. But when we presented what gas and noise to the very same cell, its response was best described using uh, this receptive structure. So uh, the most obvious difference between these two receptive structures in, is in terms of the number of special filters. So there are more filters in the receptive field uh, characterized using natural scenes, uh, which makes the receptive field more complex, and it means the cell responds to a more complex set of features in, in the stimulus. Um, so we then looked at the distribution of the number of special filters for cells in our population data using natural scenes in green bars and using white gas and noise in magenta bars, and we uh, noticed that there are indeed more filters for the characterization using uh, natural scenes. Uh, we also looked at the distribution of the difference between the number of filters um, for, for the receptive fields characterized using natural scenes and white gas and noise uh, for the same cell. And as it can be seen, this distribution is very asymmetric and it is a skewed to the right um, towards having more special filters for the characterization using uh, natural scenes. So um, we looked for reasons to explain our findings. Um, so first, we had to check if the extra receptive filters that we get using natural scenes are not artifactual or because of any other issues, for example, because the cells often respond with higher spike rates to natural scenes. Um, so since we've used maximum likelihood estimation, uh, we can make sure that there is no artifact in the uncovered uh, receptive filters. Also, um, 
We did a control analysis and it turned out that identifying more receptive filters on natural scenes is not actually related to the higher spike counts of V1 cells on these images. Um, so this cannot be an explanation for our findings. The other explanation that we thought of was adaptation of V1 cells to the statistics of natural scenes and what gas in noise. So um, adaptation can be defined as a change in the model to better describe the cell responses under a new stimulus regime. Uh, so it is model dependent in this case and can be captured using the mathematical description that we have for a cell. So if I go back to the model, um, a change in this model can be either as a change in the uh, receptive filters or a change in the receptive nonlinearities, including the input functions or a spike in nonlinearity. Um, so far, I've only talked about uh, the changes in the number of receptive filters, but another thing about these filters is that um, they have significantly different output distributions on natural scenes and white gas and noise. So I mentioned that the difference between uh, the white noise and natural scenes is in their second and higher order statistics uh, that mostly account for features like edges and contours in natural scenes. Uh, which show a strong similarity to the kind of receptive field filters that we find for V1 cells. So this means that the distribution of the output of these filters on natural scenes would be very different from uh, white gas and noise. Um, so take this filter for example. So if I apply this filter on our natural scenes and white gas and noise images, uh, these are the distributions that I get for the output or feature contrast of this filter on uh, natural scenes in green and uh, white gas and noise images in magenta. So note the difference between the broadness of these two uh, distributions. Uh, we get a much broader range of feature contrast on natural scenes than on white gas and noise images for these V1 receptive filters. So uh, it is possible that uh, V1 cells adapt their dynamic range to account for this significant change between white noise and natural scenes. Um, so, to see if this is actually the case, we did a separate control analysis in which for each cell we matched the range of feature contrast on natural scenes uh, to the range of feature contrast on white gas and noise, and we re-estimated the number of receptive filters for cells under this matched feature contrast natural scenes. So, for example, this corresponds to the range of feature contrast of this filter on um, white gas and noise images. Now, if I only sample natural scene images that have um, a feature contrast within this range and use them for receptive field characterization, I can match the range of feature contrast of natural scenes to the range of feature contrast of white gas and noise for this filter. Um, so, uh, this is the distribution of the difference between the number of filters for uh, natural scenes and white gas and noise that we had seen before. After matching the range of uh, feature contrast of natural scenes to white gas and noise for these cells and we estimated the number of receptive field filters, uh, we get this distribution. So we can see that for most cells, um, the number of receptive field filters found using this uh, matched feature contrast natural scenes has dropped to the number of receptive field uh, filters that we, we have found for these cells using white gas and noise images. And in other cases, the number of identified filters using this match feature contrast natural scenes was either less than white gas and noise, or no filter was identified at all. So um, this suggests that the um, higher range of feature contrast for V1 cells on natural scenes is actually responsible for finding more receptive filters for these cells on these images. And also, when presented with um, natural scene images, uh, V1 cells operate at a different regime than when presented with white gas and noise, and different dynamics of neural processing might be in place. Uh, we also found significant differences between the receptive and nonlinearities of V1 cells between uh, white noise and natural scene. So, this is an example cell, and for this cell, we found a single filter using white gas and noise characterization and a single filter using natural scene characterization. And the difference between these two filters was statistically insignificant. 
Uh, for the response nonlinearities, what I'm showing here is the composition of the input function and the spike in nonlinearity in the model, which uh, directly relates the output of these filters, which is uh, the feature contrast, uh, to the response of the cell in terms of firing rate. And that's given for the characterization using white noise in magenta and natural scenes in green. So um, first, note the difference between the domains of these two functions, and that's because of the um, difference in the range of feature contrast of these two filters on white noise and natural scenes. And second, see how the natural scene uh, response function has shifted to the right uh, similar to the contrast gain control effect that uh, we often see for V1 cells. Um, we can also compare the response functions within this shared domain, which corresponds to the range of feature contrast for what gas and noise images. And uh, if we do that, we can see that when the stimulus changes from natural scenes to white noise, there is a significant amplification in the response function uh, within this low feature contrast range uh, corresponding to the uh, con uh, feature contrast of podcast and noise images. Um, so we generalize this analysis to cells with different number of filters on white noise and natural scenes, and we use a uh, quantitative index to measure these changes in the response functions between these two stimulus regimes. And we found that for 85% of cells, when the stimulus was um, changed from natural scenes to white noise, there was a significant amplification in the response function within the range of future contrast of white gas and noise images, uh, similar to the pattern uh, shown in this picture. And for about 5% of cells, we found the opposite effect. And for about 10% of cells, we found no significant changes between the response functions of the two um, stimulus regimes. Um, now, taken together and to wrap up, um, the cells that showed an adaptation effect in our population of V1 data as a result of the change in the stimulus statistics were, were about 90%, which were in the forms of a possible change in the number of receptive filters and a change in the um, future contrast response functions. And uh, among these cells, more than 95% of them showed a significant amplification in their response functions within the low feature contrast range uh, when the stimulus was switched from natural scenes to white gas yes and noise. Um, so I would like to finish by thanking all the people that were involved in this study and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, we have time for one, maybe two questions. Uh, so the first question is, did you consider using phase randomized natural images as a third option, which would contain the spatial frequency and orientation statistics? Um, no, we haven't used um, any other stimuli, although we, we have used white and natural images, but that was just in one experiment. And uh, um, so we found similar effects to um, natural scenes, because when we white and natural scenes, we just remove the second order dependencies, but there are high order dependencies, high order statistics, and um, we see that um, we see similar effects to natural scenes. Uh, but we've done that for only like handful of cells, so we don't have a population to compare them to uh, uh, this population that are presented in this um, talk. Okay. Thank you. And um, second and last question. Um, have you looked at pairwise interactions? In other words, how is uh, white Gaussian noise versus natural stimuli reflected at the coupling level? Um, so does that mean um, pairwise correlation between cells, or you mean between uh, cells in the So maybe to, to specify more, if, if you wanted to decode white Gaussian noise and natural stimuli, do you think couplings would contribute to the accuracy of decoding, or should firing rate be enough? Oh, so you mean like a population coding instead of um, single cell coding? Yeah. Uh, no, we haven't done that because um, so the model that we've used um, it's only for single cell um, encoding and um, no, so we haven't looked into uh, 
pair was correlation of neurons, although that's that's a, a good option to look into. Okay, then it's a third and last question just popped up, so I think we still have time for that. Um, so, do models estimated from natural stimuli do a better job of predicting responses to white noise than vice versa? Um, um, no, because there is adaptation, so the model uh, that we get using white noise is best um, for predicting responses to white noise, and the model that we we have estimated using natural scenes is best to predict responses to natural scenes, and that's another indication of adaptation between these two uh, stimulus regimes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, so I'll kick you out, Ali, and then I'll invite okay. the next speaker on. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Too. Welcome, Joram. Thank you. If you could try to share your screen. Yeah, there we go. Great. Thank you. Okay. Can you? We can see the slides. And yeah. now we can see your. One second, though. I want to. Well, you can see me, everything is good because I cannot. So we can see you, we can okay. see your slides, but once you go full screen mode, we'll see your mode instead of the standard mode. Well, um, now, now it's fine, can I go on? Um, or you want me to go full screen mode because. If, if you can try once again, um, going full screen mode. If not, we can just go through it um, and then present it. Wait, no, no, I do want to go full screen mode for yeah. sure. Um, do you have two screens? I do have two screens, yeah. Maybe maybe you're sharing the No, I'm, nah, uh, okay, let me, sorry about that. Um, it worked. No worries. Uh, um, I want to stop sharing and I'll start sharing the other screen. Okay, yeah, that's one of Oh, stop sharing here. Okay, and then I will share this screen and I will share the screen one. Share. And. Okay, we can see your screen now. Now we are in full screen mode. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. So our next speaker is Joram Bernschau from Hebrew University, and he'll talk about analysis and modeling of response features of accessory olfactory bulb uh, yeah. Right. So thank you very much. Um, I should have been now in Melbourne, uh, enjoying this conference and also visiting my sister. But unfortunately, this is not. Uh, not happening, but I'm uh, still happy to talk to you from where I am in Jerusalem. The original uh, title was the Analysis and Modeling of Response Features of Accessory Olfactory Bulb Neurons, but this is a big story, so I decided to, to focus on a small part of this, and so the more accurate title would be Stereotype Presentations in a Randomly Wired uh, System. So, <clears throat> I have to explain the system that we study. Um, it's a chemosensory system, as you and as you may know, there are multiple chemosensory systems uh, in many animals. The system that we have is called the main olfactory system, uh, but there are others. And one of the most important systems, and the one that we study, is called the vomeronasal system. It's also known as the accessory olfactory system. Here you see a diagram in a mouse 
uh, head showing the key structures of the system. And except humans and some uh, apes, most vertebrates uh, possess the system, definitely many mammals, including mice. And the system is, uh, the way we see it, is largely designed for processing cues from other organisms. So mainly conspecifics, for example, other mice, but also from predators. But generally, it's a system that is supposed to process signals with innate meanings, such as pheromones. This is one class of signals. And here's a general layout of the nasal system. So there are sensory neurons uh, in the nasal cavity in a special organ. They project to structures that are called glomeruli in the olfactory bulb. And specifically, they project to a region called the accessory olfactory bulb. It's a small region within the entire olfactory bulb. And in the olfactory bulb, you have principal neurons, which are called mitral tufted cells, and they sample the inputs from these glomeruli, and they send their axons to regions in the amygdala and the hypothalamus that are known to control social and other innate behaviors. But unlike the male olfactory system, the sensory neurons of the vomeronasal system, they project to multiple glomeruli. And in addition, the mitral cells in the system, the projection neurons, they sample from uh, number of glomeruli and it's a variable number of glomeruli. So here you see a very nice image by Ramon Cajal showing you a section of the brain and you see the AOB and you see the part of the main olfactory bulb, the main olfactory system counterpart of the structure. And if you look at this, the AOB seems messy and at least to me by eye, and looking at several images, not just this one, the connectivity in the AOB seems random. And the question is how can a system that's designed to process cues with innate relevance, which uh, implies stereotype responses, can be so random. In other words, can one achieve stereotype representations despite this apparent randomness? So in order to answer that, I have first to, or to explain what we did, I have to explain our data. So first of all, we have electrophysiological data. And in our experiments, what we do, we use uh, multi-site electrodes and we record activity of the neurons that I mentioned, the mitral tufted cells of the accessory olfactory bulb. We present stimuli to these, uh, to, the, to the sensory neurons, and then we measure the rate changes in the uh, mitral tufted cells. So here are examples of two neurons. One is specific for female urine, the other one is specific for male urine. This is just an example to show you the type of data that we have. And in the analysis that I'm uh, doing now, um, each response is condensed to a single, single value, which is just the average firing rate over a prolonged temporal window. In our data set, we have about 240 AOB neurons. And importantly, we have responses to six different natural stimuli. These are urine mixes from males and females from three different mouse strains. Okay, so six different stimuli. In addition, we also have chemical data. So the chemical data are measurements of molecule levels for the very same stimuli that we use in our electrophysiological experiments. And we have two data sets, one is for volatiles and the other one is for peptides. And the focus here is on peptides because these seem to be the more interesting class of molecules for these neurons. So just to show you uh, an overview of the data. So this is a matrix showing you the responses of our um, of, of the neurons. So each column here corresponds to one of the six different stimuli, the, the female urine stimuli, the male urine stimuli, the different strains, and each row therefore is one neuron. Uh, and we see that the firing rate changes. And this is a similar description of the chemical data, of the peptide data. So again, the stimuli in here, instead of neurons, each of the rows corresponds to one of the different molecules. And so the experiment or the analysis that we want to do is that we want to simulate the responses of the neurons to these chemicals. I will explain how we do this. The parameters of interest that, that we want to explore are the number of mitral tufted cells. So in this uh, cartoon, you can see three mitral cells that sample, each of them samples one of the molecules. But we also want to play with the number of chemicals that are sampled by each of the mitral cells. So here you see, again, three mitral cells, each of them samples five different molecules. And here is the modeling. It's a very simple modeling, especially for this kind of a conference. But the response is a linear summation. It's a graded response. So there's no thresholding here. This is just a response of a neuron uh, with a certain uh, to, to certain stimulus is given by the neuron's tuning function and the, to the different molecules and also the concentrations of the molecules 
in the specific uh, the specific sti stimulus. So we have six different stimuli, and so we can show this uh, graphically as we have a tuning matrix of the neurons for each of the molecules, where the dots correspond to the to the higher uh, weights. And then we have the measured molecule concentrations. And if we multiply these matrices, we get the simulated or the modeled responses of the neurons to the stimuli. And so the question that we want to ask are really about this tuning functions. And the question is, first of all, do the modeled responses fit the actual data that uh, we measured in our elect electrophysiological experiments? And more, more importantly for this talk, are the repeated realizations of the modeled responses similar. So in other words, do we see a stereotypy in the responses that, that, that we get when we, when we uh, randomly um, assign weights to the neurons? In other words, when we randomly assign the tuning functions uh, in the matrix T. So this is the, the focus of, of, the, of, of the motivation for this analysis. And the question then is, how do we evaluate whether uh, we have similar or stereotypical responses? So these are the, this is the real data. This is an example of model data. And there are several measures that could be compared. So we could look at the population sparseness. We could look at the neuronal or the lifetime sparseness. We can look at the mean population response to each of the different stimuli. And we could also look at response categories. So for example, we can define a neuron that's female specific or male specific or a neuron that's selective to a specific uh, strain of mice. And we actually did all of these analysis and we used them to compare the modeled and the real data. But I don't, I don't have time to talk about all of these. I want to talk about one measure, which is the distance between the population level representation. So by this, I mean just looking at different vectors, uh, different columns here, that show the, the population response and to compare them to each other. And again, there are many ways, of course, to compare population uh, level um, uh, um, representations. Uh, we use various measures here. I want to show you the results that we obtained with the Euclidean and the standard Euclidean distances. So this would be uh, a matrix of the pairwise distances between all these different stimuli. So of course, it's a, it's a symmetric matrix. We only care about one part below or above the diagonal. So we have this values for the real distances, for the real data, and then for the model data, and we can compare them. So essentially, we're, we're comparing, we're correlating the, the, the two different measures of pairwise distances. <clears throat> and this is these are the results when we look at, um, at, uh, at the similarity between the, the simulated data and the real data. And what we're, the, the, this, this number is the correlation between the two response matrices, the, the, the two, sorry, distance matrices that I showed you before. And we see the correlation, the mean correlation over repeated simulations as a function of the number of sampled molecules. For example, here is one molecule sampled, and this is for five molecules sampled by each microcell and so on. Uh, and the conclusion here is that, and it's a little bit surprising perhaps, that even with random sampling of molecules, we get some aspects of the data that are really fit well by, by, the, by, by, by the model. So this is, this is one, 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 one observation. There are other measures that also reproduce well. Um, but we know that this is, uh, the tuning functions are not completely random, and, you know, and we know that and there are also deviations from the real data. And the main question is, whether the distances that we obtain upon repeated realizations, are they similar to each other? So this is really the question of stereotypy. So in this case, it's actually a very small simulation just because I didn't think there was a need to do more. So I have 10 repeated simulations per condition where I uh, repeatedly sample these tuning functions. And so this means that we have 10 by 10. So we have 45 unique pairwise comparisons uh, um, um, and the question is whether they are similar to each other, okay? When we, uh, all these 45 uh, pairwise compar comparisons uh, over the repeated sim um, realizations. And this is what you see here. So this is the mean value of the correlation between the distances across the repeated realizations, again, as a function of the number of molecules that each mitral cell uh, samples. And we also see the spread of the individual points shown here, um, shown here in red. And so the, what you should also note here is that the axes don't start at zero, but they start at 0 0.8. So the correlations are very, very high. And one thing that we see that the mean increases 
And also the spread decreases as we increase the number of sampled molecules. And that's a good thing if we want to achieve stereotypy. Now, these results are with 237 neurons, and this is a number that, that we have in our neuronal data set. But we know that there are more neurons in the AOB there, on the order of 6,000, maybe 7,000 projection neurons in accessory olfactory ball. And the question is, what happens when we use more neurons for this uh, simulation? Do the, do the, do the um, real simulations become more stereotypic? And the answer is definitely yes. So again, keeping the same axis, we see that the correlations are increased and the spread is much smaller, so the correlations are higher. And this is the key point, really, that I want to make here. So that with a sufficiently large population, these and there are other measures of the distance between the model uh, data uh, that I did not show you here, uh, everything becomes more stereotypic. And this is even under um, completely random sampling of the molecules and the glomeruli. So let me summarize uh, what I tried to, to show you here. First, uh, that random sampling of molecules can replicate key features of the neur neuronal response. Um, second, that the random sampling yields the stereotype representations across realizations. And I remind you that different realizations are like different individuals in this context. That is different mice, for example, different wiring patterns in the AOB, which are supposedly random. And I showed you also that stereotypy improves with a number of neurons. And for some, for some of the metrics, like those shown here, also with a number of sampled molecules per uh, glomerulus, that's molecules per microcell. And after doing all these analysis and looking at this again and again, I asked myself whether this is surprising or trivial. And, and sometimes you begin by thinking it's surprising and then you think it's actually all very trivial. And I think that if there really are uh, enough unique cues associated with each of the stimuli that, that that mice emit, and these are complex stimuli, right? Urine stimuli. And if there are enough receptors to pick these unique uh, hues up, and if there are enough mitral cells to sample the receptors and their combinations, then it's not so surprising. But maybe it is surprising that all these conditions are, uh, are uh, fulfilled. And now the last question is, what, what is all this good for? What is this, why, in, how, in what sense does this, uh, is this design good? I mean, wouldn't it be simpler just to have receptors for stereotype components, for example, in predatory urine or in uh, uh, a different uh, conspecific urine parenting cues, reproductive cues, and just have labeled lines and, and respond to those? So, yes, this is a good and simple solution, and it works. It would work for some signals, but not for all of the signals. And here we have to make a distinction between pheromones and um, and signature mixes. So pheromones are predictable cues that elicit stereotype responses, and their detection and processing is probably simpler. But in contrast, we have signature mixes, which are com unique combinations that are useful for discriminating among individuals. And we know, I, did, I have no time to show you, but we know that the vomeronasal system is really involved in, in various aspects of individual re recognition. And you cannot predict these mixes in advance, or maybe like antigens in the sense that you don't know what you will encounter in your lifetime, and also their significance is initially not known. And what the data shown here, uh, uh, or what I show you, showed you here indicates is the wiring of the AOB is suitable for discriminating these signature mixes and for maintaining the stereotype measures of similarity. And this also allows, would allow mice to discriminate among individuals and also maybe to assess the kinship or the relatedness of different individuals to each other. The very last thing that I wanna say, of course, or is that I've shown you a very small subset of the data analysis. In analysis, the real picture is more complex, and hopefully one day uh, this uh, you will be able to read about this. Um, and the last last thing is just to, to, to acknowledge the people who are involved in this work. So most important is Rohini Bansal, who collected all the, all the neuronal data for this experiment, and uh, Max Speer and Ma Max Nagel are, are collaborators in Aachen, who are part of this project, recording also from the Vermeer nasal system. And all the chemical data comes from uh, Pavel and Romana mm -hmm. at the Charles University in Prague, uh, who did the analysis and collection. And thanks to our um, funders, and thank you for uh, bearing with me. I'm done. Thank you very much, Yuron. Um, so Thomas has two questions, and I'll quickly ask him to come on stage. Um, just a second.
right. Hello there. Hello. Yeah. So my question was um, uh, about the um, assumptions of your model. You don't seem to assume that uh, there was already a response to several orders at the receptor level. Is that correct? And is that what happens in the LAB? Uh, no, uh, no, it's not what happens at the AOB. I, I did a very gross simplification here in the sense that I equated the molecules with, uh, with the glomeruli. And of course, um, we know that a given receptor can respond to multiple glomeruli. Uh, so, 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 so in that sense, it's very much of, of a toy model. I, I don't think we have, we, there's some evidence indicating that, that receptors are very, uh, are very sensitive, but then there are other indications that receptors are broader than that. So I agree completely that this is something not taken into account by my, my model. Um, but I have, I have the feeling that the results, well, Okay, this is just a feeling that the results would not change much if we allow each glomerulus to respond to multiple molecules. In a, in a way, it will maybe just uh, effectively increase the number of molecules sampled by each mitocell. And I should also add that the, my modeling here was completely simplistic. I mean, the linear summation is 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 one option. It could be some kind of a more of, of a, you may need some, there's no thresholding, for example, in my, in, in my responses at all. Um, and the tuning functions, we know them not to be entirely random. So, so this is the first step with many approximations and simplifications. But yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I squeeze in the second one, yeah? I also was wondering, you showed up results about distances and they were stereotypic. How does that translate into stereotypic responses or does it not? I, so, so what do you mean by stereotypic response? I mean, I would be surprised if the actual responses were stereotypic in some sense. I mean, you, you in, showed the distances between them are... Right, right, so, right, right. So, so, so you're asking a, a, stereoty a stereotypic response would probably be that, that certain stimulus elicits maybe uh, activity in the upper region of the AOB and a lower activity in the AOB. This I don't know, but I think this is a, a similar question that people ask about the piriform cortex. So, so it seems like the responses to a given stimuli are random across different individuals and maybe even across the different hemispheres, but, but you can maintain the distance relationship. This is the point that I want to make here. Our data is, there is some evidence for stereotypity, stereotypy in the responses. We know that there are subdivisions of the AOB. It's not something I can say about in this, uh, from this data, but I, I think it's, for, for the analysis of different individuals, I don't think that stereotypic responses are important. I think that stereotypic distances are what is important. The question is only how you get them uh, innate responses from that. Right. So you need something that's grounded to the, you need some grounding. Uh, so, for example, so, so, so that you know so that you run away from a predator or you know that this is so, so I, I agree with you completely. Uh, it cannot be completely um, uh, free of any grounding. And there's some I don't have a good answer. I, I can only agree that this is a good question. Um, maybe one idea would be that maybe these more complex representations can be associated with simpler markers or tags saying this is a, a conspecific or this is a female or something uh, like this. But it, it's a very good question. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so that's the end of this session and we'll have a short break of 15 to 20 minutes and then see you all again. Thank you. And thank you, you can also yeah, you can go to Neurostars to look at more questions and answers for the talks. Yeah, thank you.